here. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Leviticus and chapter 26. Coming to the end, in fact, next week, uh, we're going to finish our study in Leviticus. And, uh, and we're going to move on to, uh, to another study that I, I think will be very beneficial. And it'll be about, uh, we all know the Lord Jesus said, let your light shine, right? How do you do that? What all is involved in that? Is it just telling somebody how we got saved or is there more to it? And uh, so we're, anyway, we're going to be getting into that. I think you'll enjoy the study, but that won't be next week. It'll be the following week, okay? And so we'll, we'll get into that. Leviticus 26. Have you ever come to a crossroads in your life? Whoop. Sorry about that. I was clicking the button and didn't even realize. It. Okay. Have you ever come to a crossroads in your life, a place where you had to make a decision? It's a decision that's not an easy decision because here's the reason why. You know that when you make that decision, it's going to change the rest of your life. Now, I remember when we made the decision to, first of all, leave America, go to Korea as missionaries. That was a pretty heavy decision. And then when we made the decision to leave Korea to come here, that was an even heavier decision because of all the things we were leaving behind in Korea and not knowing what was going to be here in store for us uh, here in Singapore. And so those, those decisions, it's kind of a scary thing when you, stop and, when you stop and think about it. We've all been through that. We've all experienced that. And, and of course, one thing that would make the whole process a whole lot easier would be if somehow uh, we could look 10 years forward in time. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, if I make this decision in 10 years, where am I going to be? What's, where's this going to lead in 10 years? I guess that's why fortune tellers are so popular. But you know, really, we don't need a fortune teller, do we? We don't need one. Uh, because the truth of the matter is, even though uh, Proverbs chapter 27, uh, verse 1 None of us knows what a day is going to bring forth. We, we, we don't know what's going to happen uh, next week. Uh, we don't know what's even going, even what's going to happen. We don't even know what's going to happen five minutes from now, you know. We, we, we don't know what the future holds. But it's a wonderful thing to know that our God, Isaiah 46.10 says, He knows the end from the beginning. In other words, from the very beginning, He knows where it's all going to end up. He, he knows where it's all going to lead to. And, and that's why the wise man said that when it comes to the decisions that we make in life, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, my life verses, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. See? That, that, that's the wonderful promise we have. But, but there are some decisions that we can make, and we can actually know in advance where it's going to lead us. We, we can know in advance what the outcome is going to be. That's what we're going to see in our text together this evening. Last time in our study, we saw how the Lord God gave instructions concerning the land. He gave instructions concerning the land that Israel would inherit, and specifically in how that land was to have periods of rest. The land was to have periods of rest. We saw the Sabbath year, and we saw the Jubal year, you remember. But, but what about those laws concerning the rest of the land? Were, were, were they really all that important? Uh, well, let's just skip now to chapter 26, uh, verse 1 and verse number 2. Ye shall make you no idols, nor graven image, neither rear up a standing image, neither shall ye set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it, for I am the Lord your God. Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Did you see the connection that was just made? Do, do you see the connection in those verses? Honoring God's house, keeping God's Sabbaths are put on equal standing with honoring God's person. Think about that. It's on an equal level with honoring God's person. Certainly Israel knew it would be a terrible thing to worship pagan idols. They knew that. Uh, that, would be, that would be a violation of the very first commandment. 
Remember the first commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, verse number 4, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And so, and so the command was very clear. And the seriousness of the command becomes even more clear when we notice how that the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20 and verse 21 actually declared that bowing to an idol, what you're doing is you are actually giving the worship that belongs to God, you're giving it to a demon. That, that, that's the teaching of the Apostle Paul. And so it's a very, it's a very serious thing uh, to worship a pagan idol. Israel knew that was a terrible sin. That was a terrible sin. Uh, they, also, they also knew it would be a terrible sin to ignore God's Sabbath, all those special days that God had, had put into their year, into their calendar, which we dealt with a couple of weeks ago. And it would also be a terrible sin to disregard God's tabernacle, God's house, God's dwelling place. But here's the point. Here's the point I want you to get. Israel had a choice right? They had a choice. They could choose to obey, or they could choose to disobey. They, they had the choice. And when they made their decision, God wanted their decision to be an intelligent decision. So therefore, he told them, if you make this decision, this is what's going to happen. It's, this is where it's going to lead. You don't, need a, you don't need a fortune teller to tell you. I'm going to tell you. This is where it's going to lead. If you make this choice, here's what it's going to lead to. And so the Lord God is going to show now the consequences of their possible choices. So let's look at the chapter. Three main thoughts that we want to consider together. First of all, what would happen if they would obey? If they would obey, what would happen? Verse 3, verse number 4, if you walk in my statutes, if you do that, and if you keep my commandments to do them, verse 4, then. Okay, here comes the consequences. Here comes the consequences. You see, Israel had the choice. If they chose to obey God, keep his commandments, then God promised there's going to be four happy results. There's going to be four happy consequences. First of all, there would be timely rainfall. There would be a timely rainfall. Leviticus chapter 26, verse number four, then I will give you rain. But not, a, no, not just any kind of rain. It's rain in due season. Rain in due season. Did you know that there are, there are times when rain is bad? That's true. There's times when rain is bad. In, in, uh, in North Carolina, we, we live in a rural area. It's a farming area. And, uh, and, and too much rain, too much rain at planting time can actually cause the seed in the ground to rot before it has a chance to grow. Too much rain, not a good thing, not a good thing. And too much rain at harvest time. It can also beat the ripened fruit down to the ground so, so that it will be spoiled and the harvest will be lost. So, so the Lord promised, I'm going to give you rain, but not just, not just any kind of rain. I'm going to give you rain in due season. Well, at the proper time, I'm going to give you rain. And so he says in verse 4, verse number 5, I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time, and ye shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. Who doesn't want that? Only a fool would say, oh, no, I'm not interested. No, no, everybody would like to have that. And that's what God, make the right choice. I'll give you your rain in due season. Not only did he promise a timely rainfall, notice this, he also promised peace and safety. Peace and safety. And there's a couple of things we find here. First of all, there is safety from wild animals. Safety from wild animals. In verse number six, he said, And I will give peace in the land, and ye shall lie down. 
None shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land. Neither shall the sword go through your land. So these evil beasts that would, that would destroy, that would terrorize, uh, God said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get rid of them for you. You don't have to worry about them. Don't need to be afraid of them. But, but not only am I going to give you safety from wild animals, I'm also going to give you safety from invading armies. Notice he says in the last part of verse number six, the sword will not go through your land. In verse seven and eight, he says this, and ye shall chase your enemies and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase a hundred. Looks like those kids at youth camp chasing the counselors all over the place. Uh, five chasing a, and, and, and a hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight and your enemies shall fall before your sword. Who doesn't want victory over their enemies? Everybody wants that. God said, I'll give that to you. You make the right choice. You make the right choice. I'll give you peace. I'll give you safety. He also promised this. If they made the right choices, there would, there would be a multiplication of their population. In verse number nine, here's what God said. For I, have res I will have respect unto you and make you fruitful and multiply you and establish my covenant with you. In other words, I'm, I'm going to make your nation to prosper. I'm going to increase the population of your land. But some would, of course, ask the question, well, you know, if we have all these people, how are we going to feed them? How are we, how are we going to take care of them? How are we going to meet the basic needs that they have? Well, if people choose to obey the Lord God, then, then the fields would be so fruitful, as we saw a minute ago, the fields would be so fruitful. Look at the result in verse number 10. Ye shall eat old store and bring forth the old because of the new. In, in other words, their harvest would be so abundant that not only would it feed them all during the year, but at the end of the year, when the new harvest came in, there would be such a surplus still left in the barn from the previous year. They would have to clean all that out to put in the new harvest that God had given to them. The promise, multiplication of population, make the right choice, God said, that's what I do for you. Not only that, make the right choice, and you will enjoy God's continued presence. God's continued presence. Verse 11 and verse number 12, I will set my tabernacle among you. My soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. Just that relationship that knowing that, that we have God's presence, oh, that ought to make us want to make the right choices. Ought to make us want to make the right choices. Certainly wonderful blessings were promised if Israel would choose to obey. Notice I said, if they would choose to obey. That's one of the biggest two-letter words in the English language. If. If. Well, what about if they would not obey. Number two. Thank you, sir. Hot water and no coffee in it. Thank, thank you. <laughs> what if they would not obey? What if they would not obey? Leviticus chapter 26, verse 13 and following. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt that ye should not be their bondmen. And I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you go upright. But if, there it is again, but if you will not hearken to me and will not do all my commandments, all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but ye shall break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. It's your choice. But before you make the choice, I want you to know what's going to happen. I want you to know what the result, what the result is going to be. 
Now, the thing we need to remember here is that our God is faithful, right? He, he's a faithful God. He's a good God. He's faithful to bless us. Amen? Yeah, we all like that part. But let me tell you something. Because he is a faithful God, he's also faithful to punish sin. Even when that sin is the sin of his own people, he's faithful to deal with it. He's faithful to deal with it. In fact, that's the very truth that we find so clearly stated by the prophet Amos in Amos chapter 3, verse 2. Uh, Ye only have I known of all the families of the earth. Think about it. Of all the families of the earth, God chose Abraham's family. That's the only family he chose. He didn't choose the Crockers, didn't choose the Troas, okay? No, he just chose Abraham's family, chose Abraham's family. And he said, therefore, because of that privileged choice that God made, notice what he said, I will punish you for all your iniquities. I'll punish you for all your iniquities. So the Lord God promised that if Israel chose to disobey, there's going to be some bad consequences. Letter A, he will send terror Verse number 16, I will even appoint over you terror. In other words, God is going to give to them things that would cause them to be filled with fear. He's going to send things upon them that will cause their hearts to be filled with, with panic, with, 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 with desperation. Because of all these things that are coming upon them, God said, I'm going to appoint over you terror. Not only is he going to send terror, he said, I'm going to send disease. I'm going to send disease. Uh, verse, number, verse number 16, I will even appoint over you, notice the list, consumption and the burning egg that shall consume thy eyes and cause sorrow of heart. Three things there. There's consumption, diseases that slowly waste away the body, a burning egg, that's fevers that can cause blindness, deadly maladies, diseases that would take away their person's life. Uh, probably in there somewhere is COVID-19. I don't know. But, 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 but God said, I'm going to send all this on you. I'm going to send all of it on you if you do not obey. God said, I'm going to send terror. I'm going to send disease. Then let her see. He said, I'm going to send enemies. Verse 16 and verse number 17. And ye shall sow your seed in vain. For your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you. And ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you. And ye shall flee when none pursueth. Verse 18 says, if ye will not yet. Notice that little word, yet. If ye will not yet, for all of this, because of all these judgments that God has sent, if you still will not hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. This phrase, seven times more, a lot of commentators have all kinds of different ideas. It's found four times in this passage, and, and, and basically because seven is the number, it's the number of completion. It's the number of, of perfection. Uh, you remember it was, it was six days God created the seventh day. He rested. And so seven, it's the number, it's the number of completion. And so in my own personal opinion, I believe this seven times more simply is speaking of a complete punishment. It's not going to be halfway. It's going to be complete. God, God's going to do it right. He's going to do it right. Here's what he's going to do. Number one, he'll spoil their harvest. In verse number 19 and verse number 20, and I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass, and your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. God said, I'm going to spoil your harvest. I'm going to spoil your harvest. Not only that, I'm going to remove my protection. I'm going to remove my protection. In verse number 21, if ye walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, 
I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. And as a result of that, here's some terrible things that are going to happen. They will be ravaged by beasts. Remember before God said, if you obey, I'll take away the evil beast. Well, guess what? If you don't obey, they're coming back and they're coming back with a vengeance. Notice it in verse number, in verse number 22, I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number and your highways shall be desolate. Nobody wants to travel the roads because of the danger of being attacked by a wild beast. God said, that's what's going to happen. You disobey you'll be ravaged by beasts. Not only that, you're going to be ravaged by troubles. Ravaged by troubles. In verse 23, verse number 24, and if ye will not be reformed by me, by these things. In other words, if you're not going to change your way, in spite of all the things that God allows to come into your life, in spite of all the difficulties that God sends because of your rebellion and your sin, if in spite of all that, you don't change, you continue to walk contrary, then here's what God said, I'm going to walk contrary to you. I'm going to walk contrary to you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. You go through the rest here from verse 25 down to verse number 31. This includes, this includes invasions by enemies in verse number 25. Uh, the sword is going to come as armies invade their land. There's going to be uh, uh, troubles of pestilence. There's going to be all kinds of plagues that are going to come into their land. There's going to be famine that will come into their land, verse number 26. And, and if they still will not repent. The Lord God said in verse 27 down to verse 29, if ye will not for all this hearken unto me and, and walk contrary to me. I, I believe I got ahead of myself. I read that a minute ago, didn't I? Uh, but I'm going to read it again. Uh, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. In other words, he's, he's angry. He's angry. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins, and ye shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall you eat. You say, wait a minute, would God really do that? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, he did. Have you ever read the story in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 28 and verse number 29, where, where the famine got so bad in the land that they literally, uh, two women were fighting because they had boiled the son of one one day and eaten it, and the next day they were going to eat the other woman's son, but, but she hid her son. Yeah, it literally came to pass exactly what God said because they would not repent. They would not repent. There will be famine. God said, you don't repent, there's going to be death. Verse number 30, you don't repent, there's going to be destruction. Verse number 31, God says, all of these things, I'm going to take away my protection, and all of these things will surely come upon you. That's the consequence of your choice. But not only that, notice also God said, He's going to reject their worship. He's going to reject their worship. You know, let me just tell you, if we go out and live like the devil all week long, don't expect God to be pleased when we come in on Sunday morning carrying our Bible and singing with such a holy voice, oh, how I love Jesus. God's not impressed. God's not going to accept that. And that's exactly what God said to Israel. You choose to do wrong. You choose to go your own way. I'm not going to, I'm going to reject. I'm going to reject your worship. Notice verse number 31. And I will bring your sanctuaries unto desolation. And I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors. You bring all your sacrifices, burn all your incense. Instead of being pleasing, it's nauseating. I'm not going to accept it. I'll reject your worship. Number four, he says, I'll drive them out. I'll drive them out. 
and verse number 32 to verse number 33, and I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. In other words, God is going to allow the land to enjoy its Sabbath, uh, Leviticus 26, verse 34 to 35. But, but for the people, for the people, Leviticus chapter 26, verse 36, to verse 39, it's going to be a time when the people are afraid, the people are powerless. The people are exiles in a foreign land, and the people are homesick. They're homesick. Now, Israel, remember, Israel had the choice, right? She had the choice. She could choose to sin if she wanted to. She, she can make that choice. But the consequences are going to be severe. So you have to do the math. If I do that, is it really worth it? Is it, is it worth the consequence? Say, is, is it worth what I'm going to be facing? But suppose Israel did sin. And suppose the Lord God sent all of these terrible things that we had just heard described. Sent her out of the land into captivity and all these hardships come upon her. Is her fate forever sealed? It's interesting. That's the same question we're going to see on Sunday morning in our study of Romans, and it'll be some time before we get there. But Paul's going to be asking the same question. Hath the Lord cast off Israel forever? Say. So, so would it be, would her fate be forever sealed? And, and some of you are already shaking your head. You're right. The answer is no. The answer is no. Notice what would happen, third thing, real quick. What if they choose to repent? They could have chosen to do right, but they didn't. They chose to do wrong. They've suffered the consequence, but now they're making another choice that instead of continuing in their sinful rebellion, they're going to choose to repent. Verse number 40, if they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they have trespassed against me. The Lord God promised that he would remember the covenant that was made with the people. He would remember his covenant made to the land. And so therefore, even though the Lord God would be forced to deal harshly with Israel because of her sinful pride and because of her sinful rebellion, he's not going to forget his people. He's not for going to forget them. Verse 44 and following. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, they're outcasts now, they're exiles, foreign land. When they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away. Neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God, but I will, I will, for their sakes, remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt and in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. Wow. What a wonderful God. What a merciful God. What a merciful God. <clears throat> so understanding this, what we've seen tonight, it's no wonder then that Moses in his last sermon to the nation of Israel before he, before he was taken to heaven, Moses, Moses said this to the nation of Israel. It's found in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. He said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you. I, I have set before you life and death. Blessing, cursing. I, I, I've given you the choice. I've set this before you. Therefore, here's the admonition. Choose life. Don't be, a, don't be foolish. Choose life. That both thou 
and thy seed may live. Let me just tell you, as we bring this to a close, that uh, just like Israel, you and I face the same choices, don't we? We face the same choices in life. We, we can choose to serve God and enjoy his multiplied blessings. We, we can choose to do that. Or, or we can choose to disobey God and suffer his terrible chastisements. We, we can choose that too. And when we do that, I'm glad to tell you we can also choose to repent. We can choose to repent, to turn from our sinful way, to walk in the pathway of holiness. Bottom line, wherever we are, we are there because of the choices that we have made. You are where you are right now because of your choices. That, that, that's where you are. That's where you are. And so may God help us to choose, choose wisely, to choose like the psalmist did. Here's what the psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 106. He said, I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Oh, but pastor, that's not the popular way we do things today. That's okay. Right is still right. God is still God, and his standards haven't changed. We can choose to follow it and be blessed, or we can rebel and suffer the consequences. May God help us to choose the righteous judgment. So I want to close, give you the same admonition the Apostle Peter gave to those new believers in Antioch. He exhorted them. That is, he encouraged them. He challenged them that with purpose of heart. What does that mean? Simply means wholehearted determination. With purpose of heart, he exhorted them that they would cleave to the Lord. Don't let the world pull you away. Don't let the temptations of this world pull you away with a whole heart, determined, I'm going to stick with God. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. Because I'll guarantee you the blessings of God will be far more enjoyable than the judgments of God. But again, it's your choice. Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for your word, and we pray now that you would take these few thoughts and Apply them in each of our hearts, each of our lives, according to our need. I pray that you would help each one of us, that we might truly determine that we're going to, we're going to make the wise choices in our life. We're going to do what you would have for us to do. Lord, I pray that, uh, that you would help us to determine that even, even this evening. Before we lay our head on our pillows, may we rededicate ourselves afresh and anew to walk with a whole heart in obedience to what you would have us to do. Bless our time of prayer now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.